Very excited to be welcoming uh, not only uh, you know recent students and recent grads, but also career changers in the industry. I think it's a tremendous opportunity. So today, um, my talk is about networking and how you make those connections. They're going to help you find jobs and grow in different ways. So I'm going to close this. Talk. Maybe not. Alright, so uh, out of curiosity, why are you interested in networking? Like what are you looking for when you network? Anyone? Shout something out. A job? Job. Job? Alright, that's a good one. Anything else? Learning. Learning? Learning connections? What's yours? Learning information? Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's human nature, right? Like to make connections with people, to learn new things. And um, I like to liken networking to a superpower, right? Like, there's only so many things that we can know and understand and hold in our own heads. But networking allows us to take what we know individually and connect to a tremendous amount of people um, to like just gain value as a community. And so um, I like to share my stories just because it, it helps you realize just how important and beneficial it is. Um, and especially for students and young working professionals who haven't you know, been in the industry for a long time, it can be a little bit uh, intimidating to go out and reach out and make those connections. And so I want to uh, encourage you to uh, develop the skills that will help you be successful. Um, networking for me has been a superpower that has enabled me to have all sorts of success in my career. So, um, so we talked a little bit about why networking. I'm going to start by telling you a few of my own personal stories. So, what has networking gotten me? Um, Clicker is really slow. So, um, that one, uh, so through networking, through kind of you know the person-to-person -person networking, I've uh, gotten four jobs. I I haven't updated my resume in 15 years, um, right? Uh, when people ask me for a resume, I'm like, look at my LinkedIn profile. If you need to know more, just ask me. Um, most of the time, when I am Considering something in the market, people are coming to me, right? Um, so four jobs. I've literally hired hundreds of people through networking. Um, most of my roles have been uh, as a manager, um, and very few of the people I have hired have come through the HR website. They've usually come through me reaching out to my network, looking for people with talents. Um, and I'm a hiring manager today, so you know, uh, it's something that I continue to do. So um, I've built a new. I'm building a new company called Cobalt, and I. CTO and my VP of sales and my uh, first security analyst, my SOC manager, all came to me through my network, right? Which is, um, in today's world, when you're trying to build a cybersecurity team, again, really valuable because it's very hard to find out. Um, so, so those are some stories, but uh, I'll share my most recent one, which is something that was really surprising to me. Um, uh, I took investment money uh, in November of last year entirely without looking through it because somebody came to me through my network. So I was semi-retired. I have an alliance of independent consultants and all this kind of stuff. Um, I spent the summer on a beach in Thailand uh, with my family. That was fantastic. Security is a great career to be in, by the way. Very rewarding. You can do well commercially if you're smart. Um, and I sat down with a friend after I got back from my Thailand trip and I said, Hey, I'm itchy. I want to do a little bit more consulting. I, you know, two months on the beach. I want to do some work. He's like, you should get a job. I'm like, I don't want a job. <laughs> right? <laughs> Which, I mean, how often do you hear that? Right? Everybody here is here because they want a job. Right? Anyway, so he's like, okay. A week later, he introduces me to a VC friend of his, and the VC is like, we want to start a cybersecurity startup. Right? We have a bunch of money, resources, network, capital. Um, we heard you're a good guy. Right? Will you be our CEO? Like, that's a networking thing, right? Like, that was a, they didn't post a job on, you know, you know, Monster or something saying CEO for hire, right? It just came to me through my network. So, networking can be a tremendously powerful superpower. Uh, somebody mentioned learning and, and education earlier. Like, I read a lot of books, I learn a lot of stuff online, but mostly I tap my network when I want to learn something new, right? So, if I want to learn about application security, I go out and find out in my network the five people who know the most about the, that, and I sit down and I buy them coffees and lunches and I pick their brains. Because 
I'm going to get to wisdom and intelligence way faster by going through that process of talking to somebody who's really spent a lot of time in that space. So, come on in. This is a challenge with the front door. <laughs> So uh, networking is an incredibly powerful tool, um, and you know the point of today's talk is to teach you not only to think about all the different sorts of things you can do with it, besides just getting a job, but also how you can do it better and more effectively. Because um, it's one of those things that it's very easy to do poorly, and most of us, when we first start off, kind of frankly suck at it. I'm still learning. Um, but doing it well um, can supercharge your career and your success. All right, so the first thing I want you to think about um, as it relates to networking is what are you all about? What is your personal brand? What is your identity? What is important to you? Um, because that is going to carry through in every interaction that you have, right? And so uh, an example that I will make is um, in addition to my new startup, I run an alliance of independent consultants. We're about 350 members internationally, kind of a business like built by accident, um, just kind of the networking thing turned on by itself and virally just kind of expanded. Um, and one of the questions I ask every consultant when they first sit down with me is like, so what is it you do, right? And like, I get a ton of people who are like, I do everything, right? If you tell me you do everything, that means to me you do nothing, right? Or likely you don't do anything particularly well. Um, you know, I have 350 consultants in my alliance and I want to be able to form an association with you in my mind, right? So if you tell me I'm the person you want to call when you know you're in the middle of an incident and I'm the firefighter who parachutes in and can you know block and tackle and deal with that problem, then I've got an association. I can when something comes up, when there's an opportunity that comes up, I can connect you with that opportunity, right? And one of my career mentors, um, you know, whenever he sits down with me, he's very explicit. Like, what is it exactly that you want to do? And then he can connect me with the opportunity of mine. So. The first thing you need to do before you start networking is really figure out like what is it that I want, what is it that I want to stand for, um, and then when you're sitting down and talking to people, they can make that association and they'll start spreading the word about you just organically as well, right? So, um, anybody got an example of like what they want to be known for? Social engineering. Social engineering, great, right? That's a very specific thing. Right? I can I can immediately think about opportunities around that. That's a good one. Anyone else? Application security. Application security? Yeah. So uh, yeah, like if you, if you say just cybersecurity generally, that's really hard, right? And one of the challenges that I always tell people who are looking for a career in cybersecurity is like you can start anywhere and you can move around, but there's so many different subdomains. Find one that you love, and then you'll be able to find that job that much easier because there's tons of jobs out there as well, right? So if you say I'm a security expert, I don't believe you. So I've been in the industry for 20 years, and I'm not really a security expert. I know certain things well, but, you know, so, yeah. All right, one more entry. Excellent. Um, so, one of the things I opened up, um, you know, with this talk is, like, one of the things, the stage I'm at in my career is about giving back. And so, people come to me now with opportunities to speak to students at career days and all this kind of stuff, because I've made that association with them, right? And so. Finding out what it is that your brand is about will allow people to make those opportunities exist for you. It's some of us like to call it serendipity, right? But it's really about just providing that opportunity to exist. So the other thing I, I like to say about um, networking is most people, frankly, are kind of doing it wrong. So they'll they'll reach out to somebody, they'll sit down for a coffee meeting. They don't really have an agenda or objectives or anything that they really want to get out of. They just know. Like, or, or maybe they have one thing, right? So they'll say, I really want a job, and I sit down and I talk to you, and you don't have a job, and then the meeting was a failure, right? Um, instead, it's much better to figure out like three or four different places you can go in a conversation, and also to allow for synchronicity, right? So, um, you know, reaching out to somebody, sitting down and saying, oh, you know, this, this is what I'm looking for specifically before you even sit down with them, um, so that they can then prepare. Um, and then having the conversation and also allowing the sort of conversation to grow organically is really important. Um, Alright, 15 minutes in. We're good. I think, I think we're going to walk it <laughs> um, How many of you have 
heard of Dunbar's Law? Go ahead, sorry. How many of you have heard the number 150 is the most people you can keep in your mind in your network? This is like a fact of life, right? We only have so many mental associations and connections and relationships that we can make. So this is Dunbar's Law was developed by a sociologist way back in the 50s or something like that. And he found like organizations were, were organically grow to 150 and then after that they would have problems. And so you have like stories of you know Romans that would organize their, their military units into groups of 150. And there's, there's entire companies that will only allow a division to grow to 150 people and they stop. And so one of the things to understand about your network is um, you might have you know, associates, people who kind of know each other, like me and Jordy, for example, right? We kind of know that each other exists, but we don't really spend any time together. Now you've got that 150 people that you can spend some time with, and then you have a smaller circle of maybe 50 people that you can spend more frequent interaction, and then you have your four, typically your five, right? Your, your closest friends, your family, all this kind of stuff. So when you're networking, it's important to think about a rhythm and a cycle that you go through that network with, right? So who are the people that you're going to connect with um, in that group of 150, and you have to make a continual investment. Um, all right, what do you think? It's going to keep going until 10:30. <laughs> um, so I, I like I will use a kind of a rule of the people who are in my five. I try to make sure I talk to you at least once a month, right? The people who are in my 50, I try to make sure I talk to at least once a quarter, and the people that are in my 150, I try to talk to at least every six months, right? Because you can't talk to everybody all the time. There's just so many, so much limits in terms of the time of the day, right? But the other thing is being on top of your network on an ongoing basis means that people are much more likely to do favors for you, think about you, and help you if it's more than just a one and done kind of interaction and conversation. Come on in. Find your seats. Um, so thinking about that uh, strategically, like who's in my five, who's in my 50, who's in my 150, and thinking about how I spend time with them on a, on a continuous basis is really valuable. So for example, um, I mentioned my career mentor earlier, this guy named Steve Munford, he was the CEO when I worked at SoFos and stuff like this. And I make sure that I talk to him, like he's not my circle of five, he's not like my friend, family, kind of closest associate, but I make sure that I sit down with him at least once a quarter, right? And like we find time for each other, and he's been tremendously supportive and you know, helped me achieve a lot of career success. And you know, just making sure that there's that uh, reoccurrence means that he's willing to take the time because we've developed a relationship over time rather than lots of people who I worked with them, who also worked with them seven, eight years ago, haven't stayed in touch and then they, they lose that, that benefit of that connection. Um, so thinking about your kind of that inner circle of influence and then how you can reach others as well is a really important thing. So each of your people in your network unlock their networks. So one of the things that was most exciting to me about the co-founders of my new startup was they have entirely different circles than my circle. My circle's security, right? I know a lot of people in the security industry, a lot of people know me. You know, one of my co-founders, he's funded, you know, 50 different SaaS companies, right? And he's got relationships with the CEOs of all those companies, so that when I want to go and talk to those, he can provide a warm introduction. I don't know those people. It's a great additional circle. The other guy um, knows all the VP of engineers because he does a, he has a dev shop, right? And so he has all these other relationships. So, Thinking about the people who are in your inner circles um, and how they can help you through extended circles. One of the things that we tend to do is our innermost circles tend to be people who are most like us and we spend a lot of time getting very, very close and insular, right? And so the real risk in this is, um, you know, five years from now you've all got your first job and then you get laid off, right? And they laid off the whole team and nobody has any connections outside of Corporation ABC because everybody's been talking just amongst themselves, right? If you've maintained your circle of in connections um, of people who have outside circles, then it's gonna be that much easier for you to find the next job and the next job and the other opportunities and, and so forth and so on. Likewise, as it relates to learning and development and all these other activities, right? Like, if everybody you talk to is a network security engineer, then you're not learning about application security, you're not learning about social engineering, you're not learning about all these other topics, right? And so, thinking about you know, having access to these other circles is really important as well. Um, another thing that I like to talk about is, you know, this kind of mythical law of attraction, right? And some of you will have heard of this, which is this idea that if you, if you put things out in the universe, then and you tell the universe what you want, it'll come back to you, right? And this mystical mumbo jumbo stuff, but in, in fact, in reality, really what it's saying is 
If I tell people what I want, they will hear me and it will spread and things will come back to me. Right? It's about being explicit about what you want and actually spending the time to think about it and then spreading the word. And one of the, the secrets of networking is probably 9 out of 10 interactions will not directly support whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. The, you know, they won't have the job for you. They won't be the person who can tell you the thing that you need to know. But they'll know the person who knows the person, right? And so, you know, actually being explicit and putting it out there into the universe does bring it back to you, whether or not, you know, you, you realize it. Like, when I went down and sat down with my friend Steve and I said I want to do a bit more consulting, I was not expecting Steve to hire me as a consultant, right? He found the VC who had the need that, you know, connected me to my next opportunity, right? So it's those those kind of cascading effects, and that's what the law of attraction really is about. It's about being explicit about what you want, and then telling people so that they can find those opportunities and bring them back. Um, so asking for help, and being very specific and practical in what it is, right? So say, for example, you're looking for a job, right? And you go and you sit down with somebody, and you go, all right, I'm looking for a job, and it looks like this, and all that kind of stuff, and then that's the end of the meeting. What is that person gonna do as a follow-up to that meeting? Anyone? Probably nothing, right? Because you haven't told them what you want, right? So, like, for example, you sit down with a person, if they don't have a job, maybe they can introduce you to three other people that might have a job, right? Maybe they can tell you a good event to go to, or, you know, somebody else that you could talk to, that kind of stuff. So, when you are going for your, your networking interactions, be very explicit about what it is that you want. And I usually like to have a list of, like, four or five things. And I usually get one back. But one is a win, right? Um, and if you only have a list of one thing, then if they if they miss on that one thing, then you've missed the entire opportunity of that interaction. Hello. 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 Um, another thing that I've learned in the last couple of years um, that I was not very good at initially, besides the clicker, is um, the value of diversification of your network. Um, I talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, so, you know, for, for many years, like, I went to the same security events year after year, right? Um, which is great, but you see the same people year after year, right? Um, and it turns out that there's a perfectly great um, meetup on SAS across town. And you never go to that because it's a SAS meetup and there's security groups. Or there's an OWASP meeting that you've never gone to. Or there's you know, uh, a Vancouver board trade meeting, right? Like, there's a lot of other opportunities to build and diversify your network. One of the things for me right now is I'm desperately trying to hire uh, female cybersecurity experts into my organization. And so I'm reaching out to all my female contacts and saying, who do you know, right? Because um, diversification is, is incredibly important <coughs> inside our organization as well as out. Um, and my theory is if I can have a few of my first hires be women, then it'll make it a lot higher, easier to hire the next round of women as well. And as we, we all need as much great talent as we can get. So thinking about diversifying your network, not in terms of just like going to different security events, but different types of people with different circles, um, will make it a lot more effective for you to get to what you want. Um, so, so that's another thing as well. Um, everybody else is doing it. <laughs> um, so before I, I, I kind of get close to wrapping up here, any, any questions or thoughts or comments? Anybody looking for a job? <laughs> <laughs> um, so using social. Um, social media is a powerful tool for good and evil. Um, more recently, evil. Uh, but in cybersecurity, it's, it's very, very powerful. And people ask me, like, you know, how do you use it effectively and all this kind of stuff. So there's, there's two primary networks that work really well for me. Um, I don't really use Facebook, uh, but that's you know that's more friends and family. LinkedIn continues to be a really powerful business-to-business -business connection network. It's great for sales. It's great for recruiting. It's great for a lot of different things. Um, you know, people tend to be very permissive and open as it relates to connecting to people on LinkedIn. That can be good and bad. You have to be careful about it. There's a lot of um, state-sponsored actors who are trying to connect to you and stuff like that. Um, so um, the, the two social networks that I really like, um, LinkedIn and Twitter. And Twitter is like one that I am still wrapping my head around. Um, but Twitter is an absolutely fantastic 
um, tool for connecting with cybersecurity experts on specific things that you want to learn about, right? So, like, if LinkedIn is a business to find jobs and, and network and connections, Twitter is like people share all sorts of really valuable advice and links and shortcuts and all this kind of stuff. And you can follow people on Twitter, you don't actually have to have a relationship with them and you can start to extract value out of that. And some of those things actually turn into serendipitous opportunities. Like, I was following a lady named Kate Brew on Twitter who does social media for uh, Alien Ball. And she's like, I need to interview somebody on a sock. I'm like, I'm building a sock. And she's like, great, I'll interview you. And then, you know, she interviewed me and then she was talking to somebody about the interview after the interview and it's like, oh, I want to talk to this guy. And so now I have an opportunity to have a business partner in Pakistan, right? Like, who knows where these opportunities come from? Um, but, you know, Twitter can open you up to a whole different set of connections and networks. Um, it's very, Twitter is great, uh, it's much more geographically independent than, say, LinkedIn, where you tend to be locally focused. Um, so I recommend those two. Um, I have, I'm, you know, my daughter's figured out the Instagram and all that kind of stuff, but that's not really my game. I'm sure somebody's using it for cybersecurity effectively, I just don't know who that is. So. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, kind of a closing comment is find a way to make your interaction memorable, right? So I always put an offer out there. If any of you who are students are looking for a job or a connection, like seriously, reach out to me and have a coffee. I know all the hiring managers in town. I will help you find a job. Um, I, I am absolutely not kidding about that. Usually every year about two people in the room take me up on that offer. I'd love for it to be ten, right? I'm hiring directly as well as, you know, finding jobs for other people. So please, please reach out. Um, and I have found a ton of people who are like first time in town, first, first job in the industry, uh, that, that starting job. And it, for me, there's nothing that makes me happier than to help, you know, a, a young person or somebody who's changing careers find that first entry in the cybersecurity. So please reach out. But um, when you reach out and you're sitting down with people, like how do you make it so that you're not just another coffee meeting in a day, right? Um, how do you make it so that they're likely to remember you rather than the 12 other people that they've had coffee with that day? So think about what it is that you're going to do to make that interaction memorable, right? So, I mean, common you know things are you know do a little bit of research beforehand, find out something about that person, and have a conversation on a relevant topic, right? Um, I've had people bring me books. I've had people, you know, share very specific, um, you know, pieces of advice and stuff like that. Personally, I love meeting uh, new graduates and students because they have a fresh perspective, which is hard for a jaded old guy like me to get. And so it's really, really valuable. So think about specifically when you're reaching out and networking with people, like that hiring manager is going to talk to 12 people. How is it that you're going to stand out and be different and be memorable? Um, and just spend a little bit of time and energy. So um, now that I think everybody has entered the room, <laughs> um, I'm pretty much wrapped up. Uh, a couple closing thoughts on myself. If you would like to connect with me, uh, I'm on LinkedIn. My Twitter handle is Mike Largast. Um, as I said, I'm still figuring it out. I got the 800 followers. I was excited about that. You know, a piece of fruit gets 30,000 followers in a day. I don't get it. Uh, <laughs> you know, I would say as a follow-up to this, make a list of five contacts that you want to reach and reach out and connect with them and use the advice that I gave you earlier, right? So what is it exactly that you want? What are you gonna ask them for? You know, what are, the, what, what are the asks that you're gonna put out there? So if it's for a job, like don't just be like, do you have a job or are you gonna hire me? But like, who can you introduce me to? You know, where would you recommend I go and talk to somebody? Who do you know that's hiring even if you don't know them personally? That kind of stuff, right? Um, so write down that list and actually like review the list prior to sitting down with them and all this kind of stuff so it'll, it'll be top of mind. Um, I, I will take notes in meetings, right? I'll pull out my phone and go, I, I'm writing this down, it's a great idea, because otherwise I'll forget, you know, I'm old, it's, it's normal. Um, but, you know, don't, don't feel ashamed to like actually come with a list and go through it with somebody, because it just shows that you're prepared, you're interested, and you're engaged. Um, try to attend a new event. So, how many of you, this is your first BC Aware event? All right, you win, right? Um, but also, try some other events. I actually, um, if you go to, uh, www.skynorthern.com, which is my other business, slash Vancouver-security events. I should write it up there or something. Um, I've got a list of all the security events that happen around town, um, just to make it easy for people. Um, if you uh, if you ping me on Twitter or something, I'll, I'll post it there. Um, and so, like, you know, if you're looking for like a casual coffee meetup, there's the Vancouver 604 group. So if you're into DEF CON and all that kind of stuff, um, you know, go to that on Monday morning. If you're into 
audit and compliance and all that kind of stuff, the ASACA meetups are great, right? If you're into more technical talks, the B-Sides meetups are great. But also get outside of the security community and talk to other groups. Because everybody's looking for security talent, and a lot of the non-security people uh, don't know how to find and, and hire security people. So getting into some of those other groups can be very helpful as well. And then lastly, I'm hiring. <laughs> so I'm looking for security analysts. I'm looking for cloud native developers. I'm actually looking for a marketing professional as well. So you know, if you're any of those things, please come talk to me. I'd love to, to talk to you about that. So any any questions or, or follow-ups? Yes? Michael, uh, for if you never met with someone and you receive an uh, email from that individual, what kind of criteria do you use that you have to accept what you plan you might? Yeah, so I mean I mentioned that like I've got most of my jobs through my network and all this kind of stuff. Always get introduced if you can. Somebody knows somebody, like you know somebody who knows that person, try to get an introduction. Yeah. Like I will almost always take out an introduction from somebody who's if you know if Angelo comes to me and says, hey, Michael, you should really meet with this kid because I think he's a new cybersecurity grad and I think he'd be great for your team, I'll take that meeting a lot more than I'll take a cold, right? So just find somebody in your network who can introduce you and like take a couple hops to get there if you need to, right? Most of the time somebody comes at you completely cold, like we're all busy people, right? And so most of us will tend to screen those out, but not everybody, but some people will take. Like on LinkedIn, do you uh, advise people to network or accept invitations or? I will tend not to accept the invitations from Iran. For some reason, I'm getting a lot of those right now. Um, and, and like PLA units in China, I don't know what they're trying to do. Um, I generally tend to be pretty open if they're in cybersecurity and they're connected to a bunch of people I know. Uh, but uh, that, you know, I'm also like I don't share a lot of sensitive data on LinkedIn because you know there's certainly a lot of um, social engineering type attacks that happen that way. Um, but yeah, I tend to be open. Other questions? Yeah, go ahead. And how do you uh, kind of prioritize the checking the LinkedIn feed or your Twitter feed? It's a you know, constant feed of information that's coming from there. Like how do you use Social media overwhelm, right? I, I don't have a, a magic recipe. Um, though I, I have some tricks and ticks, tricks that I use to um, keep my feed updated. Because one of the things about having any sort of social media feed is if you are a regular user of that feed, then your stuff gets bubbled up in the algorithm and people are more likely to like and see it and share it, which means that you get better traction on your social network, right? So this is how people like game Instagram get 14 million followers and all this kind of stuff. It's just, it's activity level. So if you only post on LinkedIn once every three months, LinkedIn is going to do nothing with that post, right? But if you post on LinkedIn once a day or once a week, then it's more likely it'll be seen by people, be more likely to be liked by people all this kind of stuff. Same just go like, if you visit a website and they do a new blog post that you're interested in once a week, you'll go back and check it weekly. But if they never do a new blog post, you're never checking it again. So there's a frequency element. So a trick that I use to deal with frequency is um, I use an RSS uh, reader for all my news, right? So um, the one I'm using right now is Feedly. Um, and so all of my different news sources come into my Feedly and I can scroll through that really easily in a day. Feedly directly connects with social media publication, right? So I can click on a link, go, I really like this article, share it. And that's a 30 second activity, something that I like that I read and I share. And like, I don't just share it on my social networks, but also share it specifically to people, right? So for example, I came on one around a fractional CISO work the other day, and I'm like, that would be perfect for George Pajari, right? Because he's doing fractional CISO stuff, so I shared it with him, and then he shared it with his network, right? So there's lots of ways to take advantage of that. So Feedly, integrating all your news, like, if you're, if, you're going, if you're still going to websites to visit stuff, that's a really kind of antiquated way of getting your news. Um, the thing I like about Feedly compared to the social feeds is like the social feeds are algorithmically gamed to give you sensationalism and bad stuff, right? Whereas with Feedly or any RSS subscription, you're deciding what you see and then you, you're, you're working your way through that, right? So you're not being played by the algorithm quite as much, which to me is a big kind of nasty evil in this world. Um, so uh, using that, I also use Buffer occasionally. So if I'm posting too much on LinkedIn or Twitter, I might use Buffer, which schedules it out so it's a little bit less frequent and stuff like that. Or if I know that I want to, if, say I'm attending an event like this and I want to put a bunch of postings um, to come out during the event, um, I can pre-schedule those with Buffer. They'll come out at a given time of day and stuff like that. So those are some tricks that I use. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, do you have any comments on, uh, like what if you have something fairly extreme so when it comes to like image management, like I feel like a lot of this is like marketing. Yep. So if you follow the lines of thought 
from someone like Richard Stallman, mm -hmm. who, who's quite extreme. Like maybe that's not what people want to see or hear, but that's who you are as a person. Do you have any thoughts on you know, toning it down? Or well, we, we talked earlier about like what is the brand that you want to portray, right? And so, like I I I, I bucket myself into different social things. So my LinkedIn posts tend to be pretty professional. My Twitter posts tend to be a little bit more snarky. Um, and like people know that about me, right? And so like my LinkedIn network is my professional network. And if you follow me on Twitter, you're not just going to read about cybersecurity. You're going to read about you know a little bit about my kids and a little bit about the environment and a little bit about other stuff. And, if you don't want to follow me on Twitter, don't follow me on Twitter, no big deal, right? So <laughs> recognizing what's appropriate for different social networks, I think is a good approach to that, right? I would say generally on LinkedIn, you want to keep it moderately professional, right? Like if you get too far, if you get political on LinkedIn, then the alt writers will come after you and it's just like, it's not worth it, right? So that's just an opinion, but yeah. Does that help? Okay. Other questions? Right. Um, so, do you know what you want to do? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think the same rules generally apply. So, knowing what you want to do, um, the thing that I would suggest um, as a starting point is find people who can introduce you to people who are already doing that job and sit down and interview those people, right? Um, one of the things that I do all the time is I interview subject matter experts as part of my networking. Right? So, like I'm a new CEO, so I sat down and talked to a friend of mine who runs an HR department. I got to learn about HR, right? Sat down with another friend who knows about marketing. I got to learn about marketing, right? Pick their brains on stuff. So, in your case, you're trying to get into a new career. So, talk to five or ten professionals who are in that industry um, at different stages in their career as well and ask them for advice. People love to share advice, right? Um, there's a whole, whole joke in uh, the security industry, which is, well, just in networking as well, which is, you know, if you want money, ask for advice, and if you want advice, ask for money. Um, which is true, absolutely, right? I mean, my, my whole sales approach right now when it goes to talking to customers is, hey, I've got this new startup, I want to test out my thesis on you and get some advice. And like two-thirds of those turn into sales funnel opportunities, right? Because like, people are like, great, this sounds great, you know? I, I, I don't have my defenses against like being sold to, so, yeah. And the same goes for like, uh, you know, interviewing, right? Maybe the way you get the job is you sit down with a hiring manager and go, I'm looking for advice on how I get successful in my career, and the hiring manager takes a shine to you and hires you, right? So, so that's another approach that can work as well. Yes? What if you have a fairly negative um, like outlook on, say, the network? Do you see it as like social engineers? Like, or, or like with HR recruiters, do you see them as like obstacles towards hiring managers, do you have any thoughts on like that, if that's how you feel? Yeah, I mean HR has a job to do, right? Um, they are the ones who deal with the, the volume of applicants in large organizations and help filter through for hiring managers, right? But I, in my experience, like most people are not getting jobs through the HR department these days, they're getting jobs through network because people are learning how to do that more effectively. Um, I, I mean, yes. It can be used for social engineering, right? Like it's a very powerful tool for social engineering. If you're smart, you can find out all sorts of things about my self startup if you just know how to look online, right? Like that's that's the reality of the situation. Um, it like there's always trade-offs with these things. Um, so I think the benefit is worth the risk, but you have to manage manage yourself carefully. Um, I, I guess the point is if you are actually jaded and, and when people need you, they come like it's it's uh, like obvious like. Any, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, I think you have to tap your well of enthusiasm and find a way to let that shine. Like, I mean, one of the ways you make yourself memorable is by being enthusiastic, right? So, if somebody comes, like, if I'm sitting down with somebody and the reason they're sitting down with me is because they want a job, but the reason they want a job is because they are miserable at their current company, <laughs> right? Like, don't be that person because I don't want to hire you. Like, it has nothing to do with whether or not I think you're a good person, but like. You need to find a way to, like, you know, tell that to your girlfriend or your dog or your fish, right? <laughs> and like, and, and bring positive energy because people want to work with positive people, right? So, I mean, it doesn't mean you can't be a curmudgeon and be successful. It's just like try to not bring that to the interview process. Right? So, yeah. yes, being straight up. Other questions? All right. Well, I think nobody else is going to enter the room. Um, I'm up front if anybody wants to connect with me, and thanks all for coming in today.